In 1761, the Corsican patriot Pascale di Paoli masterminded the successful eviction of the Genoese from Corsica. A year later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau commented in his social contract that one day this small island will astonish Europe. Sometimes we ask what historical effect an individual can possibly have. Well, in the case of a Corsican boy born in 1769, quite a lot. The birth of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1769, the second son and child of Carlo and Laetitia Bonaparte, in a family that would eventually number eight children, came just a year after the French conquered the recently independent Corsica. Signora Bonaparte's ancestry as the Ramolinos could be traced back to 14th century Italian nobility. That tenuous noble connection was just barely enough that the French government granted the family minor noble status. This move allowed a 10-year-old Napoleon to enter the Royal Military School at Brienne in France in 1779. The military school was known for its rigorous academic and physical program, which Napoleon enjoyed. But attending school in France meant that he was also exposed to the condescension of his classmates, who mocked his Corsican accent and his humble economic situation. Despite these obstacles, Napoleon persevered. He eventually earned an appointment to the artillery section of the National Military Academy in Paris. Just four years into this appointment, the French Revolution broke out. Napoleon had a decision to make. Should he remain in Paris and be part of the revolution, he did think of himself as a follower of the Enlightenment, or should he return to Corsica and fight for independence there? In the end, he did neither, or rather both, in September, he returned to Corsica intending to fight for independence, but he was rebuffed by the Corsican nationalists because his family had accepted minor noble status in France. So instead, he joined a pro-French Corsican group. After he helped them organize the Corsican National Guard, Napoleon drew up a petition to the National Assembly in Paris, asking that Corsica formally become a part of France, with its people enjoying the rights of French citizenship. Then, he returned to France to fight. Napoleon joined the Jacobins in 1792 and was thus ordered about by Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety. In 1793, the Committee of Public Safety sent Napoleon to fight counter-revolutionaries and their British allies at Toulon. His success was cause for celebration and for worry. Remember, just a year later in 1794, Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety were ousted from power. Napoleon only narrowly missed being arrested and possibly executed during the Thermidorian reaction. Only his lack of direct involvement in the Committee of Public Safety spared him. It turns out that while Napoleon was hailed as a hero by the people of France, and especially the people of Paris, he was viewed with suspicion by the members of the new government, the Directory, because of his formerly close ties to the Committee of Public Safety. This meant that for a few years, Napoleon's career stalled and he searched for ways to resurrect it. Then, in 1795, Napoleon helped to put down one of the last counter-revolutionary uprisings in Paris, attracting the favorable attention of the Directory and of a woman named Josephine. In 1795, Josephine de Beauharnais was already a widow. She had been the wife of a lesser member of the French nobility, and she and her husband had been imprisoned during the terror. She was released only after her husband had been guillotined. The stories of Josephine's purported first meeting with Napoleon are many. The most romantic of them revolves around the return of her husband's saber to her young son. Most likely, however, the two met at a party. In 1795, Josephine was the lover of Paul Barras, a member of the Directory. It's certain she and Napoleon could have met this way. Once Josephine and Napoleon met, they do seem to have fallen in love. At least, given their love letters, Napoleon certainly did. Josephine became Napoleon's mistress. Their love affair encompassed many love letters, which survive to this day. Then, in March of 1796, Napoleon married Josephine and became stepfather and eventually adoptive father to her two children, Eugene, who'd serve in Napoleon's army and eventually marry the Princess Augusta of Bavaria, and Hortense, who married Napoleon's youngest brother, Louis, who'd become the King of Holland in 1802. 
Well, now that Napoleon was a married man and a family man and thus viewed as more trustworthy, the directors made Napoleon commander of the Army of Italy in 1796. Ironically, this is the very same year that the Bonaparte family officially changed their spelling of the name to the more French Bonaparte. Professionally, this was a time of great enjoyment for Napoleon. He found an army that was completely ineffective due to the fact that it lacked almost any supplies. He whipped them into shape. It's what he loved to do. And the resulting successes of his army against Austria and Prussia made Napoleon the toast of Paris. Napoleon kept extensive diaries of his campaigns. After his success against the Austrians at Lodi, he noted that, I realized I was a superior being and conceived the ambition of performing great things, which hitherto had filled my thoughts only as a fantastic dream. I saw the world flee beneath me as if I were transported in air. At this point, Napoleon was commanding his post as though the army were his personally. He independently pursued war and, incidentally, also pursued peace. In 1797, Napoleon arranged a peace treaty which gave France control of the Austrian Netherlands, that would be Belgium, Venetia, and the satellite Cisalpine Republic in northern and central Italy. At that point, only Great Britain remained as an enemy to the French. From a personal standpoint, Napoleon's life wasn't so happy. His family, in particular his older brothers Joseph, who was a member of the Ancien Assembly, and Lucien, who was the speaker of the Council of 500, did not like Josephine, and they saw to it that Napoleon discovered her affair with a young lieutenant. Napoleon was reportedly furious with her actions, and he would begin taking lovers as well, although Josephine would not. This was apparently her only extramarital affair. Perhaps his personal discontentment led him to imagine and push for greater military responsibilities. He focused his sights on Egypt. When pressing for an army to conquer Egypt, Napoleon remarked that in order to truly destroy England, we must occupy Egypt. The approaching death of the vast Ottoman Empire obliges us to think in good time of taking steps to preserve our trade in the Levant. From Napoleon's perspective, capturing Egypt would cut Britain off from relatively quick access to South Asia since France could block access to the Red Sea. So, Napoleon set off for Egypt with 35,000 soldiers and a shipload of scientists, some of whom were already dreaming of the possibility of forging a canal through the Isthmus of Suez. After pausing to conquer the island of Malta, Napoleon defeated Egyptian forces at the Battle of the Pyramids in July of 1798. The British weren't stupid. They knew what Napoleon was trying to do. They sent a fleet to the Mediterranean to counter the French. The British fleet was led by Admiral Horatio Nelson, who was short of stature, blind in one eye, and who'd lost an arm and most of his teeth by this point in time. Under Nelson, the British trapped and destroyed the French fleet in August of 1798 at the Battle of the Nile, effectively ending French control of Egypt. Undaunted and temporarily trapped on land, Napoleon set off to conquer Syria, but he was forced back by dwindling supplies and disease. Although he managed another victory against the Turks in Egypt, Napoleon would eventually return to France, hailed as a hero despite actually devastating losses. He lost roughly two-thirds of his original fighting force. When he returns to France, Napoleon realized that France's enemies, Great Britain, Austria, and Russia, had formed a second coalition, the first one having been formed during the French Revolution. They wanted to protect their European interests against France, especially since France seemed willing to extend its borders, and since France had shown support for revolutionary activity elsewhere, like in Poland and Switzerland. Upon his return to Paris, Napoleon learned of a plot to overthrow the Directory. The conspirators included two of the directors themselves, the Abbe Sayez and Roger Ducos, as well as Napoleon's older brother, Lucien. Napoleon was brought into the plot as an important ally, since he could assure cooperation from the army. He led the coup d'etat on the 18th of Brumaire, 1799, or the 9th of November, when he and some soldiers interrupted the proceedings of the Council of 500, the legislative body for which his brother Lucien was speaker. Napoleon was just 30 years old. The overthrow of the Directory meant a new government. Sayez, Ducos, and Napoleon called it the Consulat, 
which brought political stability to France. The new constitution of 1799, implemented in December, made Napoleon the first consul and gave him the power to name his co-consuls. The constitution supposedly promoted universal suffrage, but this was, in reality, a mask for authoritarianism. The constitution called for three pseudo-legislative bodies, but these bodies didn't work together. One body proposed legislation, a completely different one discussed it, and yet another voted on it. Elections for legislators were indirect. Voters elected local representatives, who in turn elected provincial representatives, who in turn elected district representatives. You get the picture. Thus, real power was left with the executive branch, with the consuls. The Constitution of 1799 was submitted to all voters for a plebiscite, a simple yes or no vote that included all possible electors. 99% of the all-male electorate approved the document. This plebiscite became the fundamental Napoleonic political institution, embodying the principle of authority from above, confidence from below. The consulat institutionalized strong executive authority, which was, in part, delegated to the departements, the French districts, which then maintained a thorough suppression of the press, suppressed overt threats, and used outright bribes to get everyone else off Napoleon's back. One of Napoleon's first moves was to make peace with the Catholic Church, at the same time bringing it under state supervision. In particular, Napoleon wanted to end the hostility that had been caused by the constitution of the clergy 10 years prior. Influenced by his enlightenment philosophies, he didn't believe that the church should have an institutional role in state affairs. At the same time, he thought, there is only one way to encourage morality, and that is to reestablish religion. The Concordat of 1801 was signed between Napoleon and Pope Pius VII. This did reestablish religion, but it also helped to solidify some of the changes brought by the revolution. Napoleon got the better end of the deal. The Concordat declared Catholicism the religion of the majority of citizens, and it reintroduced the old religious calendar, but it maintained the clergy's loyalty to the state government. All clergy members who had refused the oath of the clergy before were required to resign their posts. Anybody who wanted to keep their jobs had to take that oath. The Pope also had to consult Napoleon on the appointment of new bishops, and it was now the state, not the church, which would pay clerical salaries. The church also had to agree to abandon all claims to the lands that it had lost during the revolution. Additionally, the organic articles, which Napoleon promulgated without consulting the Pope, relegated the French, also called the Gallican Church's status in France, and reduced the Pope's authority. The Gallican Church was now subject to essentially the same administrative organization and policing as any other political institution. A minister of religion was set to sit with the other ministers in Paris. No papal bull or other pronouncement from Rome could be read in churches without government permission. At the same time, the clergy was now required to read official government decrees from the pulpit. On a positive note, Protestants and Jews were granted the state protection and freedom of worship. Together, Protestants and Jews made up less than 5% of the population at this time. The state would also pay the salaries of Protestant ministers, but Jews were required to pay their own rabbis. So under Napoleon, the church gained more freedom of religious practice and improved its position when compared to its situation during the terror and under the directory. At the same time, students were required to memorize the following catechism. This illustrates how much power the state had over the church. Question, what are the duties of Christians with respect to the princes who govern them and what are, in particular, our duties to Napoleon? Answer, love, respect, obedience, fidelity, military service. We also owe him fervent prayers for his safety and for the spiritual and temporal prosperity of the state. It's clear that Napoleon was interested in developing a patriotic and obedient citizenry. Accordingly, education, especially higher education, became the responsibility of the state, a concept that was very much in line with Enlightenment philosophy. Although a national system of primary schools wouldn't be established until later in the 19th century, Napoleon established state secondary schools called lycées in 1802. These schools for boys 
were intended to educate a new generation of technically trained and loyal military officers. Students read only textbooks personally approved by the state. Later, in 1808, Napoleon would create France's first public university system. Education was increasingly seen as a value in itself and perhaps more importantly, as a means of social ascension. Napoleon also worked hard to stabilize France economically. In 1800, he'd established the Bank of France, which facilitated the state's ability to borrow money. He also facilitated the assessment and collection of taxes by ordering a land survey of the entire country upon which direct taxes were to be based. He expanded the number of indirect taxes collected on salt, tobacco, and liquor, as well as on goods brought into towns with over 5,000 inhabitants. So, the French treasury began to increase. As consul, Napoleon had managed to bring stability to France, but he still faced the threat of the Second Coalition abroad. Napoleon returned to the battlefield against Austria in 1800, after Austria refused an overture of peace. He defeated the army in June and retook Milan, which prompted Austria to sign a new peace treaty with France. With Austria defeated and Russia temporarily distracted by a war with the Ottoman Empire, that war had been prompted when Russia intervened in the Polish Civil War, Napoleon and Great Britain signed a peace treaty as well in early 1802. For Britain, this wasn't such a hardship. For the moment, Napoleon was keeping his territorial conquest to the continent, and as long as he kept it that way, Britain was happy to return all the French colonies that it had captured, gaining only peace through their treaty. With peace realized, Napoleon was free to focus on Central Europe and his secret but long-held goal, the dismemberment of the Holy Roman Empire. France first absorbed German-controlled areas on the left bank of the Rhine, an action through which Napoleon claimed that France was simply extending to its natural frontiers. This move began the process known as German mediatization, by which the various ethnic German states were restructured between 1802 and 1814. This initial annexation meant, of course, that the two major German powers, Austria and Prussia, had to be somehow compensated. Napoleon did this by shifting a number of small independent German states to their immediate control. And everyone seemed happy. However, Despite his previous peace with Britain, Napoleon grew jealous of British naval supremacy, and so, only a few months after their peace treaty was signed, Napoleon began to goad Britain into a new war. The first scene of battle would be Haiti, an island which had proclaimed its independence from France in 1801 under the leadership of former slave Toussaint Louverture, and which was supported by the British. In 1802, Napoleon restored French control on the island, he reinstituted slavery on that island in response to pressure from the sugar planters, and he captured Toussaint Louverture, who was taken to France, where he soon died. The plan was not easy to complete, however. Tropical diseases killed most of the French troops, and the British, through blockades, prevented the arrival of reinforcements. So, Napoleon was forced to concede Haitian independence once more in 1804. And so now there were financial losses to consider, so to raise money, Napoleon sold the Louisiana Territory to the United States in 1803. The price was 60 million francs, about $11 million. This purchase doubled the size of the United States and, for Napoleon, had another purpose. He hoped that France's former colony of Louisiana would help the United States emerge as a rival to Great Britain and take Britain's attention away from the continent. Despite the flare-up with Britain, Napoleon's military successes on the continent meant that, for a brief time in 1802, France had been at peace, and that was the first time in a decade. So he was free to worry about personal titles. Dissatisfied with the title First Consul, he became Consul for Life, a change which was approved by the plebiscite. So as to encourage and honor great achievements and service to the state, i.e. him, Napoleon established the Legion of Honor in 1802. This honor became a way for Napoleon to emphasize the meritocratic nature of his government. The Legion of Honor remains the highest honor that France bestows. And so Napoleon, upon his accession to political power, was proving himself to be a formidable politician. 
and one whose tendency toward action had resulted in stability for France for the first time in, well, in a long time. But seriously, this was Napoleon. How long could this stability last?